everyone, welcome to this new episode of Caroline Talks. I'm your host, Caroline Haynes, film critic and journalist, and this is the podcast slash YouTube channel where I speak to film creatives around the world about their work, the industry, and what inspires them. And today is one of my special interviews for the 2024 South by Southwest Film Festival. And I'm very pleased to be joined by the filmmakers of a very special documentary, Any Other Way, The Jackie Shane Story. And it's about a performer, Jackie Shane, who was a groundbreaking trans performer in the 1960s in Canada. And I would also say the U.S. because she knew people like Little Richard, which I was very pleased to um, recognize because I saw a documentary about Little Richard last year. And there were pictures of Jackie with um, with Little Richard in that film. So I was like, wait, wait, I know this face. But it is great to have a film made about this, I guess you could say this icon of um, Canadian music industry because she not only sang in Toronto, but she was actually in Montreal as well. And it's a it's a, I think a very inspiring film, but also a very heartbreaking film because of the way it ends, because Jackie never got to see the recognition that she deserved. So thank you, first of all, gentlemen, for um, making this film. And I forgot to say your names off the top. My apologies. <laughs> um the filmmaker joining me today are Michael Mabbott and Luca Rosenberg Lee. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you oh, for pleasure. having us. Thank you. Yeah, so this this film I think was a journey because it car- it covers decades of um Jackie's life from her from her birth her, to, through her um her transformation into a performer. She has such a, a very interesting life. Like she traveled in the circus in the U.S. because she because uh, she grew up in the South. She grew up in Nashville. She grew up. She traveled in the circus. She traveled all around the country with that and performing, um, with the groups there. But then she also sang in um. Some of the, I think some of the most well-known um, soul soul um, clubs at that point in time, and as I said, I met new people like Little Richard, who himself was very well-known, not only because of his music, but also because of his identity. Like, he was very particular about the way he looked and about holding on to that identity. And I think Jackie serves as a representation of that for trans performers. So, first of all, talk to me about making about deciding to make this film about Jackie because I think it would have been a, a pretty labor intensive um job to do with regards to just gathering all of the information the research could have been pretty intense I, I imagine it oh definitely definitely and I actually hadn't heard of Jack and Shane before I connected with Michael which was shocking to me because like as a black trans guy, I was like, oh, that's a huge part of history that I'm missing, mm-hmm. you know, is someone like Jackie Shane. So it really was a lot to put together, not just to develop the team and to find the producers who were supportive to make a project like this, but also, yeah, connecting with the family, looking at the archive. And and, and for Michael, like he spent so much time talking with Jackie and that was really where this started. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I mean, for me, it started um, because Jackie, when she... Jackie left behind when she disappeared in 1971. She left behind an extraordinary live album, um, Jack and Shane Live. And that was recorded in Toronto, in my hometown. And I heard of that about 12 years ago, I guess. And just the music alone, that this was recorded in Toronto at that time, and that I hadn't heard of it, was just an extraordinary. And that was the start of the journey for me. And then uh, it took me quite a while to track down and connect with Jackie because nobody knew if she was alive or dead at that point yeah. um, until 2016. And then when I eventually did connect with her, you know, that was the beginning, the next beginning of the journey. And Jackie and I um, spoke for, uh, you know, over a year. We spoke every week and we spoke for on average five hours each time. And um, the... It, part of the you know her story was so complex and she it was so protective of 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 who she was and um so part of our journey together Jackie and mine was gaining trust and her telling the story but once she agreed to do this um the second part of the journey was going back to her beginning and learning about Nashville and learning about what was happening in Nashville at that time musically which i think is a is an undertold story and what was happening musically during jim crow in nashville with with Lil R- R- richard and joe tex and Jimi hendrix went to nashville to learn how to play the blues you know like that i feel is an undertold story of jefferson street and all that and one of the one of the things that jackie talked a lot about was how do you tell this story 
in a feature length documentary, uh, which is, you know, and then meeting the family, as Lucas said, doing more and more research, talking to more and more people. It, it was like the, part of the challenge, and it's a wonderful challenge to have is how there's just so much it's spanning so many centuries so many decades i'm sorry um and yeah, like how do you tell this yeah so it was it was a wonderful challenge to have but um but an extraordinary challenge definitely like michael i wasn't aware of who jackie was and like her i think her impact on the music industry in toronto because whether people would probably acknowledge it or not because her um her single any other way made it to the number two um, charts in Toronto, there's no way that she wouldn't have had an impact on local musicians, you know, especially local black musicians. And it's kind of it's no, it's not kind of it is very sad that she went unknown for so long. And because and the film starts out that way with people talking about her, people who knew her as though she was like a mythological being, like you know, like. She had this mysterious disappearance. Like, how did she die? Did she just disappear? Did, like, like people had these theories. And like, the thing is, is like, none of the theories were right because she was still alive. You know, every theory was wrong. None were close because she was still alive. And she was back home in Nashville in a place where she, she felt unseen, you know? And I thought that was the saddest thing. But the, the other thing that was really sad is she had family that was right there. And the family... She may have known about the family, but the family didn't know about her. And like, as you mentioned, like her, the first people in her family that we get to see are her two nieces, um, Shabania and um, Andrini. And they are the ones who basically excavate her, um, her life. You know, they find all of the things that she owned, her costumes, her jewelry. They find her journal, her own memoir. And I think it's amazing that she, that Jackie had the foresight to write her own memoir, you know? She was like, I'm gonna do this for myself. I'm not gonna let anyone tell my story, you know? And like, what you do in this film is that like you literally have her be the voice of the film, but it's like, her voice isn't discovered until she's already passed by her family. And I think that's so profoundly sad. And like, as the, as you, like you, you see like the family, the, the, the costumes and everything's displayed almost like a museum set out. And it was like, you wish that she could have been there to tell them the stories behind these individual costumes, you know, like where she wore a particular gown, you know, where she wore a particular suit, like how she gathered all of these things. And like, while her memoir talks about her life, like there's things that no one will ever really know the history of. So talk about as documentarians deciding which parts of her story to tell, because as you said, like, it's a whole book. She has a whole memoir that she wrote. And I'm going to, let me see, I put the name here. It's called Let God Be My Judge. Um, and she has the date of it is July 1974. And with all of the conversations that you had, a year's worth of conversations always recorded, you have that, her memoir. How did you decide to compile it and edit out what you wanted to add in the film? Because you can't, it would have to be a mini series and maybe one day CBC Jen might do a mini series. But how did you go about just like, like taking on say okay these are the pivotal points of her life and this is what we want to add in but you also want to add in enough things to give it like a full well-rounded story for us yeah. to get to know and a full picture of who she was yeah it was honestly a challenge for sure because as michael said it was so rich and there was so much and we had like i'd say the main beats i guess you could say right of the story which was a lot of what she had told Rob Bowman, who is also in the film, in the liner notes of the album re-release. So there were certain parts of her life that were public knowledge that we knew were very important to hit. But then on top of that, yeah, like all the private conversations with Michael and then to find the autobiography that had stuff that he didn't, that she didn't even tell Michael, you know? And so how do we put those things together? And, and a lot of it was a lot of conversations because there are things that happened in the music industry, like her... She did have a deep relationship with Jimi Hendrix and, and things that happened with her band leader that we wanted to be in there, but we really wanted to keep a through line, which was, this is about her love of music. This is about why she left the stage. And this is about her relationship to herself, to gender and to performance. And so that became, I think, a through line for us in terms of like, yeah, what, 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 make, what do we make sure is in here and what do we, what do we take out? Yeah. And I think my conversations with Jackie 
she talked a lot about film and there was a lot of conversation um, uh, about what a film on her life would look like by talking about other films. Um, I think there was a lot of cues in her music, in her wardrobe, um, that this is who she was. And, it, you know, there was um, how she presented as an artist, I think, gave us an incredible guide of how to present this film. And and she was the film had to be, you know, commensurate in beauty and power to Jackie. And so she in her words, in her deeds, in her music, in her choice of films to walk me through kind of laid out a path for us, I think. Um, and and I feel like she guided us there to, um, um, and showed us the way in a lot of ways. Mm, what I, th I think the most unique thing about the film is the visual presentation of it. Yes, we have like the archival footage, we have the photographs, we have um, her friends who were around her at that time her music career, like talking about her for their experiences. But what I thought was really ingenious that you did is you have two um, trans performers here, um, Sandra Caldwell, who I'm very familiar with from seeing on, um, on screen, and Michaela Couture. And they do something that I don't think I've seen very I don't think I've seen done in film with regards in this style. So you use a rotoscope to do like almost like these flashback conversations with Jackie. So there's the scenes where she's talking on the phone and she's telling Michael all of these things about her life and all the and the people that she experienced, all of this drama. And you have Sandra doing these reenactments and she's in this beautiful captain, her hair tied up and she's talking on the phone, moving through her house. And then there's Michaela, who's doing the performances of Jackie when she was younger, you know, singing on stage, wearing like, I guess you could say, um, almost co copies of the of the costumes at that time. And I thought it was like brilliant. And at first I was like, hey, so, so talk to me about that kind of um, narrative choice to not only have Sandra and Michaela do it, but have them basically literally be the mouthpieces for Jackie at that point, because they're seeing the words verbatim from yeah, yeah. the from the um uh, from the autobiography and then singing the words you know Michaela's singing and she's performing in the clubs and all of that and and Sandra just like having the words like we are like in essence seeing Jackie tell her story yeah well the I guess the when Jackie was alive Jackie there's only one live recording of Jackie from back in the day um which we have in our film and it's an extraordinary performance but there's so much live uh, audio recordings of Jackie from back in the day and when people talk about her performances and being the people that were at her performances it was this electrical very personal very intimate magical thing and so when Jackie was alive I I've always loved rotoscope and I I wanted desperately to try to create these magical worlds where she was playing live so that was a, a topic a subject that uh, I pitched to her early on, but we can do a rotoscope recreation where it's this magical, beautiful watercolor come to life. And that could maybe capture some essence of what it would have been like to be in that room with Jackie. Um, and but of course, the plan was always that Jackie would be here and we would shoot interviews with her. So when she passed away and I had all of this audio recording of our phone calls, um, I mean, when she passed away, there was a while where I thought I can't make this film without Jackie and and and, you know, both spiritually, emotionally and also because we don't have the footage. Uh, and but the rotoscope eventually seemed like the most perfect combination um, to work with Sandra. And so that allowed us to not just in a really, we hope, beautiful way, recreate Jackie um, those performances and her phone calls with me, but it also what Michaela and Sandra brought to those performances personally, but then their interaction in the film. I mean, maybe you can talk a bit more like it, it, it went from almost necessity um, to a, 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 such a beautiful opportunity that makes the film so much richer. I mean, maybe. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. We were, we were hopeful about their ability to bring her to life, but it was also a risk too, because you never know how it's going to go. And uh, you hope that they can do it justice. And we were just amazed, you know, we, you do a green screen and then you have to make a 3D rendering of the space and then those spaces have to be built and then an artist has to create a concept and then that stuff has to be animated and a lot of it was riding on their performance at the end of the day as well and both of them 
just cared so much. They came so prepared and so willing to give their own experience to the role. And um, it just, you know, it, it, it turned out, I think, better than, than we had hoped. And we're really glad that it translates because when people see the film and they're like, wow, those performances, and yet, you know, we're just trying to bring them to life. And I, 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 I'm glad that that's coming across. Well, and, and I mean, Sandra and Michaela as, as interview subjects are, are extraordinary under any circumstances, but they had been inhabiting and interpreting Jackie in the rotoscope. And so their connection to this, it, it was, it was a kind of a different thing. And, you know, everybody in this film, there's, um, is so personally connected to Jackie in some way, whether they knew her, or if they didn't, you know, R Rob Bowman, who's a Grammy award winning musical anthropologist, who um, is one of the top people you'd want to talk to about any R&B and soul things. He was another person who one of the few people that talked to Jackie as well. And their connection, their their love for one another was so, so deep. So not only did we have, you know, uh, an expert uh we had an expert who loved jackie and who jackie loved so sandra and michaela having that connection because of what they were doing for the roto it was just extraordinary you know um um a very personal thing and most of our shoots ended with tears of joy of of you know but it was it was so deeply personal for everybody and so important to tell this story um and and so sandra and michaela and yeah, I, I desperately wish Jackie had been there and would, would be here to to do that. But like, there was something incredibly magical, and I think her passing made it more urgent and important for a whole bunch of people to try to tell her story. Um, you know, so absolutely. I think she would have loved it because from what you what is known of her through the documentary, she's a very she was a very dramatic person, and she loved theatrics. And I think the way how the theatrics plays out in the film in those in the sequences with Sandra Michaela would please her, especially like they like she had a very dramatic life, not only as a performer, but just as a person. Because like when she went to Montreal, somehow the mob was like, We want you to work for us. And she's like, she got kidnapped, you know, put in a car and driven away, and they're like threatening her. And I'm like, who how? Oh. That's like a movie thing. That's like a whole movie thing right there, you know, got kidnapped by the mob, like. There's not many people no. who say that and still be alive at the end of the day, you know. But the, there's one of the scenes that I thought was kind of like, I, that really made me curious to ask you about the direction of those scenes and stuff because you're kind of like directing many movies in those in those scenes. Um, Like the scene where she's talking about the, the, the mobsters have her in the back of the car and we see um Sandra as Jackie in the back of the car and she the expressions on her face is like, she's super unimpressed. But then there's, yeah. but like as she's talking about these things, you have her, you have them being reenacted, like the scene where she like looking through the window and like peeking through the curtains and be like, you know, I can't be bothered with these fools. Like, I don't, I'm going to have to like leave Montreal and get out. I thought those scenes were kind of funny in a sense because like you can, you, from listening to her and then the way Sandra reenacts it, you can see that this is what Jackie would have been thinking as she was like talking on the phone because, you know, when we were talking on the phone, we move around the house, you know? Especially when you have those, those old uh, rotor phones, you know, like the long card, they kind of add a whole dramatics to them to itself. So talk to me about those, um, that like just like constructing and directing those scenes in, within themselves and deciding, okay, not only are we going to have Sandra in the house as though she's on the phone as Jackie talking to me, where we're going to have her in the back of the mobs, in the back of the car with the mobsters, because that just lends an extra layer of theatrics. And, you know, to the story and just like really immerses you in the story. And you just be like, I want to know more about this particular event. She was such a storyteller. And that's why it's great that you picked up on that theatric side, like her ability to tell a story. It, it's all over the tapes. And so picking those stories, you know, definitely we knew the kidnapping one was going to be big and figuring out like, yeah, how how to how to tell it and how to get Sandra in that place. And and from the audio, Sandra already, she's like, I got, you know, I feel this connection. But we tried a bunch of different things, different, different ways of doing it, different expressions, different um musical tones, different um cuts to different, just different editing to try and get that moment. And um, 
and yeah, I mean, her performance is great. Like, yeah. what do you, yeah. Well, I, one of the important things, um, I mean, as, as you kind of said, you know, like that she's looking at these mobsters who are armed, like this is a dangerous situation oh. with some horrible men and that her stance is these fools, you know, right? he, one of her superpowers was that like Jackie wasn't bitter. Jackie, mm -hmm. Jackie believed that, um, that evil wasn't based in pure evil it was based in people that were scared and she thought these people were fools for being scared because they were scared because they weren't true to themselves and the for what jackie went through in her lifetime the she the humor that she had as a person like she was hilarious um it and was. her outlook on these fools was it was it was incredible and it was powerful and she never stooped to their level and she laughed at them. And that came through in the conversations and it seemed essential to get that through. But then in those, those rotoscope things, like that is such an incredibly huge ask of an actor to be able to translate that. <laughs> and comedy is harder than drama. This is nuanced and this is nuanced comedy in a very dramatic situation. And you know like we did a lot of work with with sandra and in the edit and in the roto but at the same time working with somebody like sandra and michaela did the same thing i felt like we just got lucky that these you know these extraordinary people decided they would they would do this with us um because they just delivered and you know one of the lovely parts of our job is sometimes you just sit back and an actor does something and you say, Oh my God, that's amazing. And, and so, but the, the, the humor of Jackie, it felt essential to get through in this film. And, and, um, and in our, our first screening yesterday, um, there was a lot of tears, but there was so much laughter. Um, and, and I think that's important. And for Jackie, it was, I don't even want to say a weapon, but like she was above, she rose above a lot of stuff. And so was looking down at people um, and laughing. Mm -hmm. And that's why I guess in some ways it was so important for us to find the autobiography or for the family to find it and then share it with us because she wrote stuff in there that was not humorous and was very painful. And that allowed us to then really give a more well-rounded picture of what she was going through. Yeah, I I think what both Michaela and Sandra did really does bring that side because there is no video footage of her performing. You know, there's no video perform. Um, there's no video footage of her at home and how she would have been moving through her space. But the performances, the way they do their physical actions, work with the audio and the dialogue of Jackie. Like you can believe that this is who we're looking at because like the actions fit the. The, the dialogue perfectly you know like when Michaela is performing as Jackie in the club like she she has that down pat she but she doesn't have any physical or video footage to watch and the only thing that she would have had to watch was that one scene where she was where Jackie performed at Night Train which was a tv the very first black music tv show which I had never heard about until mm -hmm. this documentary like I know that there's a song called the Night Train a Motown song called Night Train but I've never heard about this show until this documentary, I was like, I'm going to have to look that up. But again, like that one uh, performance with Jackie is the only physical um, remaining video footage. And that's basically, I guess, all Michaela would have had to work off and like interpreting how Jackie would, would have been as a performer. So I think they both did an extremely um, impressive job, like embodying who Jackie was and making sure that as we hear her talk, we get to see how she was as a person. And because music was such an important part of her life, the talk to me about the music selection for this film, because not only do we have the live recording of her music from when she performed at the Sapphire Club here in Toronto, because I'm in Toronto too, but oh, cool. but the, the choices of music for particular scenes, like we mentioned the scene with the mobsters, that has like a jazz, um, a, a, that, that has a, a jazz track working with it. Some songs are Motown songs. You know, some have that, some have words, some are just like the um the instrumental. So talk to me about not only using Jackie's music, but using other um music to accompany it since you you didn't since she only had like that one um single and then she had the the two album release, which was Grammy nominated in 2017. 
Yeah, we we worked with a great composer, Murray Lightburn, who, um, you know, this was one of the like largest projects and more, more complex ones that he's done. Um, and he really brought his heart and soul to it. And he has a lot of overlap with Jackie. And I think he was able to bring that to the project um grew up in montreal his dad played at the same place that jackie played at the esquire he also grew up in the church so part of it for michael and i was like communicating these things to him and then allowing him to bring those sounds to us and and workshop them for for months mm -hmm. and um i think one of the things that we're really proud of and that murray just nailed was um Jackie, Jackie talked more about gospel music than than R and B and soul music, and so we um, and and the you can hear gospel, you can hear the church in Jackie all throughout her career, and so um, one of the things that we did was record five different versions of of Uncloudy Day, the incredible old traditional gospel song, and in Murray's hands, we were able to do that. Um, as it would have been recorded in 1940. Uh, and then the song progressed, different versions of the song progressed throughout Jackie's life. And Murray was able to infuse, um, you know, a, a, a chronological sort of um, um, information in each song, um, of the, each version of the same song. And like the task that we asked of Murray was extraordinary um from this is this is what it would have been this is what the sound would have been like in nashville at the time this is what the sound would have been like in montreal at the time this is the sound and uh and all of the at the same time all of that blending in with jackie's music that would be an intimidating um um ask for any any composer but um and then of course it, it, the music all had to fit the emotionality of the scene um with what's going on it was a very complicated thing and the one of the the things that i'm hoping that i think is going to happen because of this film and because of jackie's family involvement in this film is the rights to jackie's music were very very murky um and and so for us to figure out how those rights worked and who had the rights and who should have the rights um and jackie's family should have the rights to a lot of her music and that is coming back now to them um but it it was uh an extraordinary complex thing so that was it was a real and we have an incredible music supervisor of course that was guiding us through all this and i have to say when we were in the the, the what you call the museum room um and we we're literally jackie's apartment her home the family when it found out that she passed away got a call and said you have to empty this house out so they went to jackie's house where she kept everything put it in a storage locker and then when we came in and met with the family, we took that storage locker and unpacked it and laid it out in that room. So us, the family, were finding all the stuff for the first time. And one of the things that we found was a box box of reel-to-reel -reel tapes. Um, and there's a bunch of interesting stuff on those tapes, but we found an unreleased recording of Jackie. Um, and I'll, I'll never forget, we were in that huge empty room with all of Jackie's stuff. And uh, we had the 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 reel to reel digitized and played a, a song called "Hey Mr. Cool Guy," which is in the film. And the song is going through this this empty, beautiful room with all of Jackie's stuff. And we were like, "Has anybody heard this song before?" And we had a musical anthropologist with us, and he said, "This song doesn't exist. We've never heard this before." And it was an, an, an unreleased original recording of Jackie. And like that was. That was an extraordinary, Definitely. extraordinary moment. So, of course, we had to use that um, in the film. And it's just so, so lovely. But um, yeah. and picking the songs at the right moment was like a huge part of the writing process. Like you got the whole album there, but it's like, where do these go? You know, and how do they set the tone with the scenes and 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 how do they play into the story lyrically as well? And that was something we, we definitely spent time thinking about. Mm -hmm. Some Something that I think it ties into that and like where she has this music that no one ever even knew existed except for her is that the mm. beginning of her autobiography that she wrote Sandra reads a line where she says I was born but I have never lived and the thing is the ironic thing is that anyone watching this documentary would say but she has lived 
Mm -hmm. You know, she led such an extraordinary life. You know, she did all of these amazing things, things that aren't even in the in the documentary, but just that you get a sense that she's had she's met some amazing people. You know, some of the most well known musicians of that time seen um lived through the Jim Crow era, you know, when uh, experienced racism, transphobia, bigotry, sexism, misogyny, all of these things. But she also still came out on top of it with regards to like, as we're saying, look at like her her mindset where she was like, she refused to be called by anyone, you know. She turned on the Ed Sullivan show. She's like, no, nah, straight off the bat, I'm not going on that show because it's racist. You yeah. know? <laughs> like she's like, I'm not doing it. And like very mm -hmm. Few artists at that time would have turned on Ed Sullivan because Ed Sullivan made people's careers, you know. But she was like, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to do it. And like she's experienced, she performed at the Sapphire Club. She had all of these amazing costumes that people look at her and say, But she has lived. But in her own words, she said, I was born, but I never lived. And when I was watching the film, and while I was just thinking uh, before the interview began, I was thinking, but her I think the reason she has never lived is because she the, her perception is that she ended up back where she began Ooh, in that she, she didn't do a 180 because the 180 is when you make a complete art yeah. and you stop there you've reached a particular point where you're saying like i'm not no longer where i was before but she did a full 360 it's, and she yeah. ended up back where she started and it's like her life paused and she she became reclusive because she was fully herself at home but she couldn't be fully herself outside of those four walls at home you know and I, I just thought that was, um, like Sandra said, it was incredibly profound. And her niece said the same thing, that it was profound. But I think it just speaks a lot to how, no matter what we think of people, it's how people think of themselves that really ultimately matters. Because if she thinks that she has not lived a life that she was worthy of, that, was, that she deserved, that she should have and could have had, because she ended up back where she began, I think that speaks a lot, not only to like how we view ourselves being the ultimate thing that really matters, but also how life is just like you it's so unpredictable you know like she has such a trajectory and then it's and I think it sounds terrible but it also sounds to how family could be our biggest stumbling block our biggest um block to where we need to get to go because the reason she ended back in Nashville is to caring for her family she had her mother who she loved but then she also had her birth mother her stepfather people who did not love her and she ended up back stuck there and her career stalls so she couldn't make any money and it's just like I'm like I get it you know like at the beginning of the film I was like but she lived the life but then at the end it was like she didn't love the she didn't love live the life she wanted so for as filmmakers as documentarians talk to me about maybe perhaps what kind of revelations you had not only about Jackie but also about life and about your own experiences as filmmakers and how you see life and how you want people to see the lives and the work that you're doing great question yeah. Well, I, if I can just speak to Jackie for a second, you know, she, yeah, sure. she, she, uh, her mother was sick, was which was one of the reasons why she left. And uh, I mean, there was no bitterness in Jackie, but she did say many times to me she wished she had brought her mother to Toronto. I was wondering why she didn't, and like, or, yeah. even when, or even California when she moved to California, it was like, why didn't you take your mama with you? Yeah, you know? I, I mean, I think it is such a complex thing, and I think part of it was she wanted she wanted out of the spotlight, and it was hard work. It was hard work for as it is for any musician. She wanted to be able to live her true self, which she couldn't do, and she was also very famous in Toronto as Jackie Shane and in using the pronoun he and she wanted and needed to get away from that so I, I wonder if it was quite a complicated if, if it wasn't as simple as her mother could have come here because then maybe she wouldn't have been married maybe she wouldn't have been able to live the life um um but you know yeah she went back to Nashville and she went she talked a lot she talked a lot about politics and she went back to Nashville and said you know I left during Jim Crow and I've come back and it hasn't changed that much and in some ways it's gotten worse you know um so I think that is yeah very yeah. very sad it's it's really interesting to hear you say that about the 360 thing I, yeah. I really uh it's true I think like you know trans people even if you've had this great life even if you have these things yeah. it's very true about what you think of yourself and what you think about these experiences and i i always took her saying you know i, I was born but i never lived yeah as that like i 
would have been different or things could have been different. I would have been different. I would have taken more risks. And in, in my opinion, I mean, she did to, to your point about what you're saying, she did a lot of stuff and a lot of stuff that a lot of trans people I think don't do because they just think right off the bat, I can't even do these things. But because she had a supportive mother, that was the thing that I think allowed her to still flourish and push herself creatively, you know, spiritually, all these things. Um, and and yeah, it's 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 it shows where her headspace was at when she was writing this. And and Michael and I talked about that too. It's like all these things are true about her. I think she says, you know, I've never experienced happiness. You know, she definitely has experienced happiness when she was on stage. But I think we all hit times where, especially if you're dealing with yourself, and especially if you're dealing with, you know, your own sadness and loss, where you feel that you've been dealt a, a dealt a bad hand. And I, I also think it's worth pointing out that, um, you know, those words were written probably in the 70s. Um, so Jackie had just been through the experience she had been through um, as a black trans entertainer in North America. Um, she had been through, a, um, I think, quite a heartbreaking breakup. Um, and so Jackie talking to me, you know, 45 years later, I think was was in a different place and i and i'm not sure we found that autobiography after she passed away i i I would love to have been able to ask her if the words i was born but i never lived still if she felt they still pertain because she was incredibly proud of her career and the impact it's had there's as you know there's a huge mural in toronto uh to jackie uh she was nominated for a grammy um, her message was being heard, you know, at the time when she was alive. And I, I think she felt she, she was so humbled and shocked that that Toronto and the world remembered her. And so I, I wonder, I would love to have asked her that. And I, I do wonder if she was in a different place in her life when she wrote those words, um, an important place for people to know about. Um, but I wonder if that's I. I and personally, I don't necessarily think that that's where she was at the end of her life. Yeah, um, her, her, her epilogue would have been very different, right? I think and, so, yeah. And um, I have time for one more question. So I want to ask you about the about her. You mentioned the Grammy and like that happened in 2017. And she died in 2019. And the reason I'm, I'm, I want to talk about 2018 is 2018 was the year the show Pose was released on TV. And Pose was the first very first North American TV show that focused on transgender identity and lives and experiences of both performers, but people living regular lives as trans people. And I, 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 when I was watching the documentary, I was like, I have to know if she watched Pose and what was her, re- um, her reaction on that. The reason I'm asking that is because you just mentioned that she talked about politics and she was a very, she was someone who had, who, because she lived such a uh, I think a very expansive life, she would have had very deep thoughts and very um, per- uh, particular ideas about politics, but also about representation on screen at the time. You know, she can talk about the music at, that when she was performing as a musician and what she and the struggles she had to go through. But I want to ask about, if, did she ever talk about the show? And the reason I'm asking about that is because I think had people known about her, she would have been a, an inspiration for people like um, Laverne Cox, you know, and Angelica Ross and all of these performers. And they'll get to know about her now because of this documentary. But had people known about her, she would have been an inspiration for them for in the making of this show. And you never know, like she, her character could have been in a, a character within the show itself, you know, as like a, a transformative trans performer on the music stage, especially since music plays a big part in the show pose. Yeah, I, she didn't, and and you know she was seventy nine, um, and she she watched a lot of old movies, um, and I, I I think I you know she was aware of of the flowers that she was getting uh, in Toronto at the Grammys, um, but I think you know she talked about the the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman more than she talked about um, you know oh, modern day. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and so I, I, I don't think, I don't think she was. I think she'd be th- thrilled, and but yeah. I guess the hope for this film is that you know, even though she's not here, that her story can be inspirational, can be, you know, and and we we um 
I was watching an episode of Poker Face, um, the amazing uh, TV show, and there's two uh, two two uh, songs of Jackie in there. Um, and obviously, you know, the makers of that TV show heard this, found out about Jackie, and that that message is getting out there, and that music is getting out there. And so I hope that even if she wasn't aware of some of the stuff that was happening um, present day, that present day people are aware of that and that her message and her power and her music and her style is going to be infused out into the world um, in the way it always should have been. Yeah, I think she she definitely had obviously some awareness, some awareness of what was going on, how things have changed. Like, you know, I, I transitioned 15 years ago. It was still a different place. Things have now changed even more since then. I, I you know, when she says about the Grammys, like, I want one of the young transgenders to uh, speak for me at the Grammys. Like, are you ready for that? And it'd be incredible. And so to me, that said, like, she knows that there's still trans people here. She knows that there's still young trans people, you know, who are newly finding out about their identities and that like her, her experience in trans lineage is important and, and that it's, it's, and relevant. Mm -hmm. It is. And um, like, I, I just have, as you're talking, like, if another show like Pose was ever to be done, I would hope that they would have like maybe have Michaela, you know, like play like Jackie in a role because I especially and I think like a Canadian show in particular because I've lived in Canada since 2009 and I will be and I will have admit I do not know much about the Canadian music history and um but like Jackie is a part of that and I think she's a part of the Canadian identity as well as the Toronto music identity so I really do hope that the film continues to inspire like so many people and that people because of this film look her up and then also look up other black performers of that time as well yeah okay so we have to wrap up but again thank you so much uh, gentlemen for joining me and for talking with me about this film and for making it and bringing Jackie to life for audiences I guess everywhere now <laughs> Thank, oh, you. thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for watching it. And thank you for this conversation. It's wonderful. Great. Thank yes. you so much. I appreciate it. And thank have a you. good day. Enjoy the festival. Bye. Bye.